Titus chapter 3, my privilege to conclude our message through Titus. Next week, we start a study through Nehemiah called Built for This, uh, just a kind of a way to be able to look and to ask ourselves the serious question is, uh, what are we building? The life that God has given us, are we building, you know, kind of on that rock or on the sinking sand? Uh, are we building a life that really matters? Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a great study to be able to go through that and get in the Old Testament, which I'm excited about. But today we conclude this book. I want to be able to kind of give you a little bit of the context because I find it really intriguing. This is a book written to a pastor from another pastor kind of encouraging him on the way to be able to really have a blueprint for church. Uh, the way that we relate to the world around us. And really, here's the heart behind it. It's like, don't forget about the world around you, church. I know it's kind of cool and we reorganize our schedule so that we spend time in the body of Christ and encourage one another, build relationships. But don't forget there's people outside of these four walls that need the love of Jesus in their life. Uh, and God wants to use us to be a part of that. But he starts out with this thought, remind them. Isn't it interesting how often we need reminding as human beings? Uh, anybody else like me have a few senior moments from time to time, right? Uh, I mean, it, it gets bad enough for me now where it's like sometimes I'll walk upstairs and be like, oh, I got to grab that upstairs. I walk upstairs and as soon as I get in my room, I'm like, what was I getting? And here's a little trick. I don't know if it'll work for you, but it seems to work for me. I'll go back downstairs, kind of where I generated the thought. Maybe the thought's just like floating in the air. And I'll kind of stand there and be like, oh, yeah, okay. So just a little trick, maybe you can. But you know, it's not just an age thing, is it? Uh, sometimes maybe we get a little bit more forgetful with age, but don't our kids seem to forget their chores quite often? Amen. It's like you always got, hey, it's trash day. Don't forget to take out the trash. Do the dishes. It's like we constantly have to remind each other. Well, I tell you, it's also a biblical principle. We see it here in the book of Titus when Paul is telling Titus, hey, remind them of these things so that they don't forget. You know, even in the Old Testament, one of the phrases you see over and over that blows my mind is it says, and they soon forgot. One of the craziest occasions is it actually says they soon forgot about God's provision and God's power shortly after he parted the Red Sea for the Israelites. I mean, I, I look at that and I'm thinking, man, dude, if, if God like parted water in front of me, I mean, I would like never forget about God's power or provision, right? I mean, it sounds logical, but if we're honest, it'd be like, yeah, I'm kind of a human being. We get distracted, we sometimes forget, and, and God needs to remind us. And so here's what he tells them they need to be reminded of. He says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. He kind of starts here at the top, if you will. He says that we need to be in submission or subject to the rulers and authorities that surround us. And I know that this is sometimes a difficult thing because we don't always agree with them, right? It's like, I, I didn't even vote for him, bro. Like I, and, I, and we kind of get on this tirade and we have opinions and, and we want to tear them down where God says, you know what? Let me tell you, when someone's placed in that position, remember this. I'm still in control, guys. I still got this. It's not like all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he won the election. God's up there going, I don't know what to do now. I guess I'm going to have to wait four more years. That's not the God that we serve. God's got this figured out. He's got it under control. And so we need to trust in God. And then in his instructions, he tells us what? Not that we should be critical of our leaders, but you know what he tells us to do? Pray for them. Pray for them. My challenge to you, the next time you feel about being critical about someone who's in authority, start praying for them. Start being active in the, that frustration instead of saying, I, I can't do anything. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you could do anything more powerful than pray for people. To be able to bring them before the Lord and say, God, work in this situation. Work on their heart. They need you in their life. God has called us to be submissive. But then he not only takes it here at the top, he brings it down and he says, all people. 
He, he says, be courteous and be gentle to all people. And I find it kind of crazy that it's like Paul feels like he has to tell us that. I mean, shouldn't that just be natural for us? Should, but it's not. It's not. We get caught in our little bubbles. We get caught in our, our self-consumed world. And it's hard sometimes not to lash out and to be discourteous to people instead of courteous. To be harsh instead of gentle. But he says that we need to be ready for every good work. And kind of maybe I think just to give us a little perspective, follow me now in verse 3, and he kind of goes a different direction. Not just remember these actions to take. Now it's almost like he says, hey, let's back up one step and let's remember this together. Verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Now, that sounds like a great life, doesn't it? But isn't that crazy when you see it written down in paper? It's like, wow, that's, that's kind of the, the reality of a non-believer, and we've all been there. It's like, yeah, you have these, these desires, and you can't control them. And that's why Jesus said, I've come to give you power over sin and death. You see, it's not just a ticket to heaven that we get in a relationship with Jesus. He says he's going to give us the strength and the power to be able to be the human beings he's created us to be. I wonder what really defines us. Is it that? Or is it what he talks about now in the next few verses? Because he gives us context not to just say, here's where you were. Aren't you so happy you're not in that same place? But he helps us to understand how we got to that new place. Verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Church, never forget where our salvation came from. It came from the loving, free gift of grace from a heavenly Father who is in love with each and every human being that has ever existed, created in His image for a relationship with Him. And sometimes we can get all twisted up in that because maybe we're at a certain place and maybe we've had some victories over certain struggles and now we have a tendency to look down on people instead of just looking right across the table at them and saying, yeah, I struggle with some of those same things. I, I get it, man. It's hard. The battle of the flesh, the temptations, the trials in life. There's a lot of ups and downs, ebbs and flows. I get it. And so that we now extend the loving grace of God across the table instead of judgment raining down. It's sad to me that more and more we start to see stereotypes, some unfounded, but quite honestly, church, some very well founded about what the church is all about that we judge, that we hate, all of those types of things, it ought not be. That's not who Christ has created us to be. He's created us to be loving vessels of His grace. And we see that now in these next verses. Follow with me now. Here's kind of, to me, the marching orders of this chapter, starting in verse 7. He's kind of said, here's, here's where you were. Remember, God came into your life and changed you from the inside out. And now He says, so... That being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless as a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice have nothing more to do with him knowing that such a person is warped and sinful he is self-condemned interesting to me is, is I, I see these two words that are really mirror images of themselves aren't they he uses one he, he starts he says excellent but he uses the word profitable and then later he talks about these arguments and genealogies and he says they are what worthless as someone who's eyeing retirement somewhere hopefully in the near future 
How many of you guys are now really interested in what is known as ROI, return on investment? Amen. Can I get an amen in the house for some of my seniors out there? Right? I mean, none of us, no matter really what age, don't want a good return on our investment. I mean, does anybody want to invest $1,000 in a stock or in something, and all of a sudden, five years down the road, you're like, oh, I wonder how that stock's doing. Worthless, bro. Oh, that stinks. But the other side of that is it's profitable. Like, oh, wow, this, I mean, this, I got a good return on my investment. And what I see here is God is laying out for us what really not only in our own walk, in our own experience, but the experience of those around us, can truly be profitable. I want a good profit. I want a good return of investment on my time and my energy and all of the things I'm involved in, and I know we all do. So I wonder if we would look at this, and even though it might be challenging, and I know, believe you me, that when we talk about being a personal witness to the world around us, it's a scary thought for some of us. Some of us are like, Pastor, I mean, I'm trying to get my act together, bro. It's, I mean, maybe one of these days I could do that. I mean, that's, that, that, isn't that kind of your job and the pastor's on staff? No, it's all of our jobs. Yes, it's part of my description as a Christian man, but it's part of yours as well. We've got to quit with the mentality of rock stars on the stage of churches and fans in the seats. There is not fans and stars it is a body of Christ working together saying, I take this serious. I want to take my niche of what God is calling me to and lock arms with my brothers and sisters and make a difference in this world for Jesus Christ. I truly believe that God wants to use all of our lives in a significant way. But the problem is we can become so self-consumed, can't we? I mean, at, at times we just look at our own situation and it distracts us and we get involved in other things and we get so wrapped up in everything that's going on in church, it's almost like we forget about the world around us. We, we avoid it. You ever heard the term, don't miss the bigger picture? I, I think that that's exactly what Paul is communicating to Titus here, that, hey, we got we to gotta run our families the right way, guys. Hey, we need to organize the church, and it needs to be operated. It, it is the body of Christ properly and through the leadership of Jesus Christ. But don't get so caught up with your church goggles that you forget about the world around you. I find it interesting that Jesus decided at the end of his human existence to be able to give what is known as the Great Commission to his disciples. He sat down his disciples and he said things like this, go into all of the world and preach the gospel. He said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. He said, stay here in Jerusalem for when the Holy Spirit's power has come upon you, you will be my witnesses. And then he goes to these different regions of the known world everywhere. I want you guys to go out and to let people know how much God cares for them. This truly is our calling and a calling I see more and more neglected in the body of Christ each and every day. We just want to kind of say, hey, I, I, I'm trying to get it together. I'm trying to, you know, have my own relationship with God. I even hear phrases like this. My relationship with God is a private thing. Christian, that is not the direction of Jesus Christ to his disciples. He said, your faith is to be a public thing, not a private thing. Yes, there are times where we're private in our prayer closets, where we're studying God's word and we're communicating with him, but it doesn't stop there. God wants us to take this message public. And we need to take that responsibility seriously. And I realize it's scary. I've been there. I, I remember the very first time that we went out what we would call witnessing. That little church that we were at in Hemet, and we kind of had this campaign. Let's go and, and let our neighbors around the church know that, you know, we've got things to be able to offer their family, and, you know, we're going to go and help them to understand really what's going on. And, man, I was scared. 
my knees just knocking, like, just, oh my, I don't, what am I going to say? I'm sure I'm going to say the wrong thing. I, I may say a scripture, and I don't know really the right address in the Bible. And there, isn't there like that sinner's prayer? What if someone says they want to pray, and, and I, don't, I don't say it right, or I miss a line in it? Are they going to go to hell? And it's like, I, you know, you get all twisted knots. When God just says, first of all, bro, it's not even about you. It's about me working through you. I'm the one giving you the strength. I'm giving you the words to say. I'm the one that wants to pour my love through your life so that they will see who I really am. And then I remember after many of those occasions being very nervous and getting to that point where I just was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to be myself. Maybe I'm overcomplicating this thing. And I bring it up because I think it's common in the body of Christ that we sometimes overcomplicate things. We have people who stand before us and they break down the scriptures and we're like, wow, I, I just don't know as much as they know. So I obviously I can't make that kind of a, a significant impact in the world around me. I, I just haven't studied. I didn't go to Bible college. When God says, just be yourself, man. Just let them know your experience. L let them know what your relationship with me has done in your life. And I remember it was one of the greatest privileges of my life when the Twin Towers had been attacked by terrorists. There was an occasion for a group of us to go down to New York and to do some ministry. And during that time, somebody that just stood on this stage just a moment ago, Luke McNeil was there in that group with us. And I remember we're trying to figure it out. We've got, what's the plan? You know, do we have tracks? And you know, all the whole Christian thing, you've got to have your big plan. And, and I remember him just saying, what, what if we just like, let's just go down to the park and we'll just, I'll bring my guitar and we'll sing and hang out and just see what God's going to do. And I was like, oh, wow, that, okay, I, I get, you can do that? Don't you have to have like materials to pass out and stuff? Like, no, let's just go. And it was amazing, guys. I mean, I don't know if you have recognized this, but he's a pretty good musician. Uh, even with just the guitar and his his vocals, he's singing. Next thing you know, I mean, there's a crowd of 40, 50 people around us going, who's this guy? It's not like the normal guy with his guitar case open looking for a couple bucks. And then we would just all kind of hang out. And if people came up to us and talked to us, but it wasn't like this overcomplicated thing. It was more like, hey, just down here from California, just trying to support you in any way we can. I can only imagine what you guys must be going through. It's crazy. Hey, tell me, tell me what's going on with you. And one lesson that I learned and I pass on to you during that encounter is simply this. When we witness, if we'd spend more time listening than talking, we'd probably be more effective. I mean, I used to have that mentality and, and the adrenaline's flowing and you feel like you got to come out with the guns blazing. Boom, boom, boom. Like, okay, I, 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 said, I did the John 316, passed out my track and I, I got it all. And they're just like, Dude, like you never, I never said a word. You never even introduced yourself to me. And sometimes when we just ask people how things are going and just show that we care, show that we're there to offer any kind of help we can, even if it's just emotional or spiritual, and say, hey, can I just pray for you real quick? You'd be surprised what God wants to do in and through our lives. But we miss the big picture sometimes. You know, just Friday... I had an occasion to miss the big picture. I don't know if you guys can see from down there, but I have a little, little bit of a shiner on my eye. I have a, a cut over my eye, and what I was doing is I went out with my boys, and we went surfing, and I went out, and I was surfing, and, you know, the, the surf starts kind of dying down, and I, I just was kind of myopic in my, my approach. I'm just kind of looking straight down. Next thing I know, it's dying, and I go forward, and boom, just hit my head right on my surfboard. And at first, I'm thinking, okay, well, it's not that big of a deal. It hurt, but, you know, I'll live. And then next thing I know, I just put my hand up, and my whole face was just bleeding because of the gash on my forehead. And, and I got to tell you, is anybody else, did anybody else get ruined by the movie Jaws except for me? <laughs> Could I get some love in this place? I mean, I'm just like immediately. It's not even like, do you need stitches? Are you going to be okay? It's like, there's blood in the water. I got to get out, right? Like, I know that the, like the shark can smell it from 40 miles away or whatever, right? So my mind's going there. 
But long story short, again, if I would have saw the big picture and, and recognized my surroundings, I probably could have had a different result. And I think we often do the same thing. We just get caught in our own little world. And God would say to us today, realize there's a, a world all around you that I want to use you and use your life to be able to express my love too. You know, when I think about some of the excuses that we come up with, at least in my own mind, I do at times, and it's like, well, yeah, you know, think about the Bible times, though, dude. I mean, it's, it, it was a simpler time, and they're walking around in sandals and stuff. They didn't have the pressures. I mean, it's just way different. I mean, their culture was not like our culture is now. You know, it feels like we're going to hell in a handbasket. It's just, it's just different. It's easy for these guys to say this stuff. I did a little research to see the context of this letter and when it took place in church history and just in history in general. You know that when Paul wrote this letter in probably 64 to 65 AD, there was a guy some of you Roman historians might have heard of, a guy by the name of Nero. Was not a good character. If you know, probably the most famous story of Nero is, is that when he burned his own city down in 64 AD and blamed it on the Christians. He blamed it on the Christians and then he began to persecute them and he would torture them in really bizarre, crazy ways. I mean, there was one, and some of us may have even seen some of this stuff depicted in movies, but he would sew Christians up in wild animal skins and throw them out in the middle of the Colosseum and just watch them get ripped to shreds by wild dogs and wild animals. He would take Christians and nail them to trees and pour hot wax all over them and then light them on fire so that he could have a light for his garden at the nighttime. I mean, there's just all these crazy stories. And you're like, oh, I guess when Paul actually says that we should be subjective to the authorities, I guess he didn't really have it that easy either. Did he? I don't think that, you know, Paul would have been one of those that said, oh yeah, I voted for Nero. He'd be like, man, Nero, I'm not, I'm not a big fan. But we need to be respectful. We need to be gentle in our approach to be able to show people who Jesus really is. You know, there's a couple occasions that we see these terms about being subject to the governing authorities. Written by Paul a couple of times, also written by Peter, Interesting fact that I also found out is, do you realize that probably close to the same time, during Nero's reign, both Paul and Peter would be killed by Nero. Paul would be beheaded. And most of us know the story of Peter who was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to have the same death as his Lord and Savior. And these are the guys that are writing, hey, we need to be subject. We need to, to realize these people are an authority over us. And I got to be honest with you, I'm not a big authority fan. Is anybody else? It's hard sometimes to have people tell you what to do. It's like, who are you telling me what to do, bro? But I found this interesting when I just kind of, in my own mind, just began to think back about the life I've lived. Grew up with parents who had authority over me. Then went to school Teachers and administrators had authority over me. Then I got a job, had boss who was in authority over me. I'm still subject to the governing leaders and the law enforcement that have authority over me. And it's like the light bulb went off, and I've never claimed to be the brightest bulb in the chandelier. But it's like, maybe God's trying to teach us something. I mean, that's kind of the way our life has been laid out, that we've always had to learn how to truly be respectful in a following position and being subject to other people. And how much more fitting those people that are running our government, those people that are risking their life on our behalf and for the safety of our family, and people in general. I wonder if we are showing them grace or if we are so irritated with people that we would rather see harm come to them than good come to them. And believe me, I've been around the block like many of you, and there are some people that really frustrate us. i got to be really honest with you. Probably 99% of people completely irritate me. Can I get an amen in the house of God? I mean, we're just irritating, aren't we? 
I mean, we make our mistakes, we say our stupid things, we take stupid actions from time to time, we hurt people around us. It's just part of this life. But would we rise above those things as believers in Jesus Christ, trusting in the faith and the strength that he can put into our hearts to be difference makers? You know, one of the cool little monikers that we have around this church is Impact Church, living and loving like Jesus. Simple, to the point. But isn't that what it's all about? That God has called us to live according to his word, to put our trust and our faith to say, hey, this is the instruction manual that my heavenly father has left me. I mean, he, he wants me to experience an amazing life and, and avoid some of the pitfalls and to enjoy some of the opportunities. I'm going to live by this. And I want to be one who's known for being loving to other people. And you remember I told you this was kind of the marching orders and he said, be heirs of the grace that Jesus Christ has given to us. When we think about the word heir, the first thing that comes to my mind is an inheritance, right? Anybody else go there in their mind? And that's right, right? Let's say, you know, mom or dad passes away, they leave an inheritance to the kids, you divide up whatever money's left, and that's your inheritance. But you see, when he's talking about it here, it's not like Jesus left behind money for his disciples. What he's talking about is the characteristic and the qualities of Jesus and the ministry he had, that we are to be heirs to that. That he has given us the investment of the Holy Spirit to equip us and empower us to be able to go out and to be gracious to mankind. To be able to have the same ministry he had, a ministry of grace and of love. You know, I love this quote from St. Augustine who wrote this about love. He said, Love slays what we have been, that we may be what we were not. I got to tell you, before Jesus Christ came into my life, I definitely wasn't a loving person. I, I had a hard time really caring about anybody other than myself. I mean, you know, you go to the store and you see people it's like, whatever, dude, stay out of my way, right? I mean, you drive down the street and somebody's broke down. You're like, glad it's not me, man. But then all of a sudden, Christ gets a hold of your heart and something changes on the inside. And you start to care about people. You want to invest in them. You want to encourage them. That's a God thing. We need to let God continue to foster that in our life so that his love is truly overflowing in and through us. You know, God has never called us to be containers, but conduits. Not reservoirs, but rivers to truly allow God's love to flow through us. I wonder what marks us as human beings. I close with this challenge. You know, most of us are familiar with markers, if you will, ways that you would identify someone. I mean, we even have them on our license, right? So if we ever had to show that license, they'd look at your picture and they'd look at the little, okay, he's 180 pounds, 5 foot 10, whatever it would be, age. And they're like, okay, yeah, that, that must be him. We have markers. Some of you maybe even have a tattoo or you have an earring. Something that someone would identify you with, right? I mean, maybe you're going to meet someone new and, and you're like, okay, well, tell me who I'm looking for. Okay, you know, a guy, you know, shorter hair, got a tattoo on my, on my left arm. Okay, you know, I know what to look for. Markers. But what God is calling us to do as his people is to be marked by his love and his grace. I wonder if when people encounter us and see us, they see people that are gracious. You know, I think about the word gracious, and at least growing up, I, I didn't really, I thought gracious was like if you had good posture, you know, and you, you were, oh, he's, he's so graceful. Or she's so gracious on stage, you know? That's not gracious. What gracious is, is comes from the word grace, which means that you give something to someone who does not deserve it. The grace of Jesus Christ, none of us deserve his love and his sacrifice, but he extended it to us. I wonder if that's the way people see us. That you know what? I, I, I feel like I can ask her for anything. I mean, she's such a gracious lady. I and mean, she'll sit down and talk to me when I'm hurting and she doesn't judge me. And 
she's just so kind. I mean, he, he's just such a man of grace. I, I feel like I can talk to him about any of my struggles and he doesn't judge me. He just encourages me and, and keeps me going on. I wonder how the world sees us. I pray that the world would always see us as people of grace, as people who truly care, that the actions and the reactions that we take are inspired by Jesus Christ and expose the world to who he really is. Sometimes I fear when I see the body of Christ that they're misrepresenting the love of God. God does not hate people. God loves people. I read in my Bible that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would receive eternal life. That he literally sent his son to die for the world. I wonder if that's the way we live our life and the message that we send to the world around us. Church, let's be gracious. Let's be loving. Let's show the world who Jesus really is.